And now I'd like to introduce Bernie Drake. He is a Peoria Historical Society's premier presenter on distilling. He is a past president of Peoria Historical Society and a history tour guide. And he's written an article on Peoria's whiskey history for Peoria Magazine. So Bernie Drake, welcome. Thank you. You can go with the Hold on, so, uh, as we go along here tonight, uh, anytime you have questions, just jump in and ask questions. All right, uh, this is a fairly freewheeling uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so, uh, of course, the title is this is Peoria Whiskey Capital of the World. Now, I have to do a disclaimer here. Because I get caught out every once in a while. Some people object to Peoria being called the whiskey capital of the world. Technically, they're correct. Peoria was the alcohol capital of the world. Now, what you did with the alcohol uh, was something else. And I could argue that Peoria indeed was also the whiskey capital of the world. But some of the purists who think that really the only whiskey in the world is made in Kentucky uh, argue that uh, uh, we should not be claiming that uh, we are the whiskey that we were. But it just rolled off um, so nicely. You know, and so, yeah. uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it was the whiskey that we were. Uh, uh, I am part of the Peoria Historic Society. Uh, and uh, uh, we are here to preserve, share, and celebrate uh, the history of the uh, Peoria County, city of Peoria, and the, and the whole Central Illinois, Illinois River uh, uh, Valley. You're going to see some of that tonight, particularly on the preserved part. Uh, at the end of this, Marine's going to have brought in some of our artifacts that we have in our collection. Marie, what do we have now? 20,000 pieces of in our collection, you know? Oh, that are just for display? No, or no, total. Total, total, total 60,000. 60,000 artifacts in our collection of the uh, uh, Central Illinois history. So we preserve that, uh, we share that, and we celebrate our, uh, our history here in, the, in uh, Central Illinois. So let's start talking about uh, distilling. First of all, if we go back into the when that first started coming into this part of the country, so uh, early 1800, uh, the filling was uh, common on the on the frontier. Uh, it was not an uncommon thing, uh, and we see here an example of a very crude uh, still out in the middle of the woods someplace, but. Um, as farmers would graze, particularly corn, uh, and if the weather wasn't just right and the corn came in um, and it didn't mature to its full maturity, that's what they call soft corn, um, they had problems what were they gonna do with that because it wouldn't lax out the winter. It would spoil before the winter was up. Uh, so, what could they do with that? Uh, and distilling was one of the things that they could do that. And once they converted it into the alcohol, then the alcohol was a commodity that they could then trade with somebody else or consume, whichever they wanted to do. So, so distilling was quite common on the, on the frontier. It was quite common here uh, in the Illinois territory uh, before we became a, a state. The history of Peoria, in terms of the starting of the distilling, is uh, actually I'm never clear on this, Marie. Some people say 1843, and some people say 1844. And I'm never sure which one is, you know exactly which one it is, Marie. I found it 1844. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll go with that tonight anyway. Okay. So uh, a gentleman named Alan Myron Cole uh, started the first distillery uh, in Peoria. And it was located. Uh, about where the post office uh, on State and Water Street is in, in Peoria, there. That's about where it's at. It's, it's very small, a little distillery. It's 
go get it. Now we had brewing in Peoria almost a decade before that. So uh, we had a longer history of, of uh, brewing than we did of, uh, of distilling. The distilling industry grew quite quickly in, in uh, uh, Peoria. Uh, this is an example here by 1860. So Civil War started in 1861. So in 1860, uh, we had on the left there, you see those uh, distillers that were active in Peoria in uh, 1860. And by 1865, that number had gone up to 14 distilleries. Uh, we were in the middle of the Civil War in 1865. But of those that were distilleries in 1860, only those were still there in 1865. So there was a, in the distilling industry, there was a lot of turnover in this industry. It could be the same distillery. I've got a distillery here. But the ownership changed. Uh, and so there was always changes in ownership on the, on the distillery. And so uh, uh, if you ever see a list of the stories that were in Peoria, in Peoria County, you would see that, you know, I think the number that we use is from 1844 to 18 to 19, 19, there were 73 different distilleries on record in uh, Peoria County. Uh, but again, a lot of times that was the same building. It just changed name, just changed uh, ownership. So we need to talk a little bit about what is whiskey and what was whiskey in 1880. Which is by 1880, uh, Peoria. Well, really, during the Civil War, Peoria is the whiskey capital or the alcohol capital of the United States. We're making more alcohol here than any other place uh, in the United States. But in the 1880s, it really started, it really started the boom. Uh, and so uh, we have different kinds of, of, of whiskey here. So we have the age of whiskey. And this is the whiskey that we're most common with today. And that's where you take the alcohol uh, and you, uh, uh, you, you uh, mix it with the water and you put it in the barrel or you maybe put it in the barrel without the water uh, and, you, and you let it, it has to be, or if it's going to be bourbon in the United States, you now have rules for bourbon in the United States. If you're going to call it a bourbon, it has to go in a new white oak barrel and it has to age for a minimum of two years. And to make the bourbon, you have to use a minimum of 51% corn and no more than 80% corn in your recipe for making the bourbon. Now, they didn't have those rules back in 1880, okay? But they did have aged whiskey. They did take the alcohol, they put it in barrels, oak barrels, uh, and they did, they did have aged whiskey. But more common was what was called rectified whiskey. And in rectified whiskey, they would take the alcohol, and they would cut that because when you do the distilling process, you come out with a, an alcohol that's like 180 proof or 99% alcohol, between 180 proof and 190 proof uh, alcohol. So you would cut that alcohol uh, with water uh, to get it down to 40% uh, or 45% or something else, uh, uh, percent or an 80 or 90 proof. Uh, but then, uh, rather than put it in a barrel of 80, you want to, they wanted to get it to market. They wanted people to drink. So they would mix things in. They put brown sugar in it. So it would look like uh, a whiskey that had been aged in a, a barrel. They might add prune juice or apple juice or lemon juice. All kinds of things that they could add in to make it uh, more attractive. So that was what we call a rectified whiskey. And in 1880, um, from the records that we have, we know that basically almost 70% of everything that was consumed, the alcohol that was consumed in the US that was called whiskey, 70% of that was rectified whiskey. Okay, cheap whiskey. All right. So, and only about 30% was aged whiskey or rye whiskey or bourbon. So if they added sugar. Yeah, did it continue to go uh, I don't know. 
Was that part of it? Probably wouldn't because there would be yeast in it. There wouldn't be any yeast. There'd be too much alcohol. There'd be too much alcohol in it. Because you're at 190, you're at 190 proof alcohol. So. Well, by the time you cut it down, you're not going. But probably. Right, but you wouldn't have any. Okay. And still, if you cut it to what proof are you cutting it to, you're still at a really high percentage of alcohol. The yeast probably wouldn't be happening. Usually it's somewhere probably around between 30 and 50 percent. Yeah. You might get yeah. So a 60 to a 90 proof, maybe 100 proof. Yeah, so uh, when I get into an argument with somebody, whether or not joy was the whiskey capital of the world, this is where I go. The whiskey that we're drinking today is not the whiskey that was being drunk in the 80s. And so we possibly were the whiskey capital of the world because we made the alcohol here and some of the distilleries rectified. But there were also a number of big rectifiers in the Peoria area that took that alcohol and then blended it to make these different uh, combinations of drinks that they would then uh, sell. So part of our story here uh, uh, starts with uh, the Civil War. And Prior to the Civil War, the only income that the federal government had came from tariffs. Okay? So we got a war, so we got to pay for the war. Now, in our previous wars, in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812, what Congress did is they passed a, a income tax to pay for the war, and then when the war was over, the income tax went away. Okay? And it did this in the Civil War also. We had a temporary income tax during the Civil War, but they did, it wasn't enough money. They needed more money, and so they instituted what was called a sin tax, a tax on alcohol and tobacco. Okay, that tax started in uh, 1862. Uh, and we've had it ever since. It never went away. <laughs> Okay, that's the tax that we that never ever ever went away. And um, so the alcohol tax was actually from during the late 1880s, the late 1800s, when the when distilling is really big in Peoria, uh, the alcohol tax is the number one uh, revenue source for the for the federal government. And in fact, if you if you are one of those people that think that the income tax is not constitutional and we shouldn't have any of that. You can blame temperance for that because the part of the debate when we were going through whether we were going to have temperance or not was if we get away with the production of alcohol, where is the federal government going to get its money to operate? And so the answer was, well, we'll have our income tax. That will make up for the alcohol tax that we've been going into. So uh, the income tax that we have today, the permanent income that the one that came in and we never got rid of, comes about uh, because of temperance, because of the temperance we live in, in the United States. So, uh, so they put that tax on the on the alcohol, and they start. Uh, so the federal government will have to start collecting that tax, all right? So a, a whole bureaucracy is set up to collect that, collect that tax. And so what they did is they set up taxing districts around the country. And the law that they used to pass it said there could only be 65 of these tax, taxing districts in the country. And I believe that is still the law that is used today. There are only 65 taxing districts in the United States. But since they were only collecting basically from alcohol and tobacco, they set up the taxing districts around basically where the alcohol was produced. So the fifth taxing district of Illinois was purely and peach. Okay. So from 1862, when we put this in place, up until the prohibition, or excuse me, up until the income tax. With the income tax, now everybody is paying, and so those taxing districts change. 
Now, I think we are now part of a big Chicago uh, taxi district. Okay. But so we know from 1862 up until about 1914 or 1950 exactly how much money was paid to Peoria and, and Pekin into this tax. And so we know that during the Civil War, that 50% of the, all, all the alcohol tax that the United States collected during the Civil War came from the fifth district of Illinois, Peoria and Pekin. And the majority of that, of course, came out of, of Peoria because there were more uh, distilleries in Peoria than there were in uh, 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 Pekin. Uh, and to give you an idea of how big it was here, uh, in 1880, uh, there were 200 distilleries in Kentucky. And in those 200 distilleries in 1880, they produced 15 million proof gallons of alcohol. Okay. In Peoria in 1880, we had 10 distilleries and they produced 18 million. So what we did in Peoria was we industrialized the production of alcohol. We put it on a big grand scale. Now, the technology of stills had improved. Uh, and so you could, they can make these big uh, stills now uh, and they can make those work. So the technology was there and Peoria took advantage of that and really industrialized the production of uh, of the alcohol. So why Peoria? Why would this start in Peoria? Uh, so we're going to take a look, a little quick look at these pieces that, that Peoria became the whiskey capital. Well, why not Kentucky or Cincinnati or Chicago or St. Louis? You know. Uh, so first of all, was the resources. We had the resources here that are going to be used to make the alcohol. So we're a big agriculture center, so we have a lot of oil. Okay. Uh, and if you want to age this in oak barrels, we had a lot of oak trees. We had a lot of forest and oak trees there. So the oak trees were the oak was easy to get at. And in those fields you had to have a heat source to heat the water up to, to uh, do the uh disposition. Uh and so we had resources around it, particularly coal as a resource to use in that. But that does not make Peoria unique. I mean, Chicago has that, St. Louis has that, Cincinnati has that. You know, there were other places, a lot of other places that had these resources too. We were also on a river that helped and the railroads were coming in in the 1860s and 70s. So that also helped with those other places. That Cincinnati's on a river, Louisville's on a river, St. Louis on a river. Chicago's not on a river, but it's on a Great Lakes system, which feeds into a river system. So we were not unique in that perspective, but it helped that we were in the center of all of that activity. What made Peoria unique is what I call the W. The first one is a welcoming attitude. The uh, Peoria welcomed distillers. Distillers were not always welcome everywhere. Uh, and particularly in the Midwest, in, in smaller, more conservative places, the silvers were not always welcome. Usually in the bigger cities like Chicago, yeah, they could, you know, there were places where they could push them off. To the side. But silvers were welcome in Florida, uh, as a uh, as a way to develop the uh, business climate in Peoria. But really the big reason, the big thing that sets Peoria apart from these other places uh, is the water, okay? We sat on top of a huge uh, aquifer. This blue dotted area here is what is called the Sampote Aquifer. Huge. Uh, you can see that it's throughout the Illinois River Valley here, but it actually goes east over here, all the way over to the Muhammad and Champagne area. It's a big, big, big aquifer. It is a limestone aquifer. So the water is limestone filled. That is the best water to use for distilling. Okay. 
and it has to do with the calcium in the water and the salts in the water and all that. I don't understand all that, but that is the best water to use. That is the water that they have in uh, the spring water that they have in uh, uh, in Kentucky and along the Ohio River down in Tennessee also. So the other places that have that water, but Peoria had it in abundance. But Peoria had one other uh, advantage. Uh, that aquifer is, is uh, underground, and that water comes out of that aquifer for, at a good constant, even today, comes out at a constant about 55, 56, 57 degrees. So it's very, it's a cool, cool uh, water. Uh, and uh, so the distillers in Peoria could use the water not only to make the alcohol, but you know, in the distilling process, once you once you boil your mash and the alcohol fumes rise, then you have to cool it down to get it back to a liquid. Okay. So they can use the water, you know, to, to wrap around the, the uh, still uh, and didn't have to use ice as much as other places used ice. Uh, this is uh, actually for a valuable uh, book. In 1899, uh, the House of Representatives did a uh, had a con uh, had a, uh, actually they called it a commission. Uh, it was called the Industrial Commission on Trust and Industrial Combinations. Uh, and one of the big distillers in Peoria, Charles C. Clark, testified. You'll see him in this moment here. He testified in that uh, uh, commission report. And he said in his testimony in there that he did, in his opinion, that the Peoria distillers had a 10% advantage on uh, distilleries elsewhere because of the water uh, in Peoria that came out of the water. So that was the, that was the big thing that we had that, that grew. Now, it, you know, this is the days before we had water treatment plants. Yeah. So to be able to get to that water, I mean, it was just six underground so you know they could just throw away a lot of it came out in springs along the walls of the of the, of the river so uh it was easy that it was easy to get to and it was the best water that uh, that you could have so uh that is probably the biggest safety difference that Peoria had uh, and why that industry really developed uh rapidly um just a little anecdote uh, about the industry and this development. I go to First Baptist Church in Peoria and a few years ago we were doing our 175th anniversary. And so I was redoing, updating and writing a new history of the church. I had to go back to all the old histories, put together the history. So in 1878, First Baptist Church in Peoria, uh, they, they passed a new covenant to the church. And the new covenant in the church forbid the sale and use of intoxicating liquor. Well, you know, there probably were people in that church that worked in the distilleries or had connections to the distillery. So 26 members of that church left Peoria First Baptist Church, went out and formed their own church. They called Peoria Baptist Church. What I thought was really cute was that in the newspaper, forever in the community, as long as that church existed, and always in the newspapers, they were always referred to as the Wicked Baptist. <laughs> So, uh, obviously, the industry had an effect on our uh, community, not only economically, but uh, uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, so, back to the alcohol tax. One of the things that happened with the alcohol tax was that Congress would pass the tax. So, in July, Congress passed this tax uh, on alcohol. But it wouldn't go into effect until maybe December. Okay? So, what would happen is the distillers would produce like mad and charge the extra 20 cents, whatever that tax is going to be, charge that extra, even though they weren't paying it back to the government until December. So, it was, it was a problem for them, right? So, the problem with that was that you had a whole bunch of people coming in. With new distilleries, and the distilleries that are already there were producing 
much as they could. And so you got into a situation where uh, supply represented by these three beautiful fields outstripped uh, consumption about three to one. And so once you had that situation, the price of that alcohol was plummeted. And so the distillers in Peoria were trying to, to were wrestling with this problem of how do we, you know, how can we fix this so we don't do this overproduction uh, all the time. Uh, and so in the 1870s and in the early 1880s, they had a, what they called pool. And a pool was when a group of distillers would come together and voluntarily they would join the pool and they would say, okay, I'm going to limit my production to just this much. And all of, all of them would agree that they would limit their production, try to keep their production down, so the production would come back in line with supply and that's a great problem. Okay. Sounds good, but it never worked because some distiller subway would be, be, be try to sneak some production in and raise the price or do more production than he was supposed to. And they had penalties that they were supposed to uh, pay a fine if they did, but no, you know, there was no way to enforce that. So the pools didn't work. And so they needed a way to come up, or that the, the distiller, the owners of the distillery, we're looking for a way to come up to try to handle this problem. Uh, and in 18, well, in 1887, then we'll come up with an answer to that. The answer started in the early 1800s. This is John Rockefeller, okay? And John Rockefeller and his one of his uh, uh, associates, a fellow named Fagler, uh, came up with an idea of how because. He could, he wanted to consolidate the oil industry. And he had one, one big company that did everything from drilling and taking it out of the ground and refining it and then marketing it and selling it. He wanted to hold it. But he was limited in a lot of the states that they would not allow him to move that company into a bigger company. So what they came up with was what we what crazy known as the standard oil trust. Okay, and so in 1887, uh, the distillers in Peoria, led by Joseph Greenhut, I'll tell you more about Joseph Greenhut in a, a little bit, uh, established the Distillers and Cattle Feeders Trust. So this was a this will become known as the Whiskey Trust. So this was an effort on behalf of these distillers to try to monopolize the production of alcohol. Okay. It was headquartered in Peoria on North Jefferson Street. That's the house that it was in. Today it's a parking lot next to the Queen Johnson Law Office. Uh, originally, 65 distillers uh, joined the trust. All of them are from Kentucky North um, uh, and from the Mississippi uh, East origin. Uh, later, more uh, uh, distilleries from other parts of the country will join. Um, but it was basically an upper midwest. Most of them were from Illinois and Indiana uh, and uh, uh, some Missouri. Uh, so of the 64 that joined the trust, uh, 24 of them were in Illinois, 12 were in Peoria. The, the, blue, the blue brackets around there, that's the 12 that were uh, located in, uh, in Peoria. One, there was three in Pekin and one in Canton that was in the, in the trust. So it was primarily in Illinois, primarily an Illinois thing to start out with. So why was it called the Distiller and Cattle Feeders Trust? That's because that the distillers had discovered that the mesh, after you did the distilling, you had this grain left over. And they found that they took cattle. And so all of the distillers, and all these, most of these distillers are located along the Illinois River, starting with that post office on State Street going south towards Barton. And I'll show you a map a little bit later with all these distilleries on. Uh, so you'd have a distillery, and next to that, they would have a big cattle feeding lot. And they would be feeding the cattle this and supplementing it with hay. Uh, and uh, uh, that was another business that they were in. It wasn't a very pretty business, but cattle you know, we see the 
feeding lots or the cows or whatever they feed, but they were actually chained to a big long trough. And you know, the uh, mash would come down the trough and, then, and they fatten them up and they and put them within slaughterhouses down on the river down next to these distilleries, also. Um, and so Peoria became a stockyard town and became a uh, uh, a uh, uh, market for uh, beef and for uh, hogs. They fed hogs as well as beef. And one we know from some records, from the staff records, that uh, I think it was the a it was a little bit later than that, that they were feeding 28,000 head of cattle uh, in the, in the along the side of the building. So Peoria was the second largest stockyard in the United States. Only Chicago was larger than Peoria for its stockyard. And the Board of Trade, which is where you buy and sell your grain, the Board of Trade in Peoria was the second largest Board of Trade. Uh, only Chicago Board of Trade was larger than uh, uh, Peoria. So you had this big stockyards here, and then you had these slaughterhouses right next to the stockyard where the uh, uh, beef would be uh, uh, where the stone cow would be processed. Uh, how many of you know Bueller Home on Saturday Street? Christian Bueller got his start, uh, made his money in the meat market. He had uh, like uh, Ravers and all of them, they had meat markets all over the West. That's where he made his money from. So, this, so they formed this trust. So how does this trust work? Well, so you have the, you have the uh, distiller and cattle feeders trust right here. Uh, and they had nine trustees. Three of the trustees were from uh, Peoria. Uh, Joseph Greenhut was a trustee. Uh, Samuel Correa Woolner, who you'll meet in a little bit, was a trustee. And John Francis was a, a trustee. Uh, and what you do, so you had a, you had a, a distillery up here. Why do we own? Yeah, I own this distillery. Okay, they want me to join the trust. So the first thing I have to do is I have to make my distillery public. Uh, I have to, I have to have shares. Uh, and maybe I only have ten shares, and I own them all together. Okay, but it has to be a public corporation that has shares. And what I do is I transfer all but one or two of my shares to the trust. Okay. Now the trust controls. I had 100 shares and I transferred 98 into the trust. The trust controls 98 of the shares of my company and I control two. Okay. So if you do that, then, oh, then for doing that, I get back a trust certificate. Um, and with that trust certificate, I'm going to get paid dividends based upon the number of trust certificates that I have. Okay. So you get a whole bunch of, of, the script of uh, distilleries that do that. So all those shares are put into the trust, and the trust with those nine trustees now control all of those shares. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to start closing distilleries. And that's exactly what they do. Of the 65 distilleries that obtained in the original trust in the early years uh, of the trust, they ran maybe 12 to 16 distilleries a year. So the big majority of those distilleries were closed, shut down. And that's how they got rid of that overproduction, and that's how they controlled uh, private control of the farm. Okay? Now you got other advantages. Uh, so if you're a distillery of one that was closed, uh, you still have those trust certificates, but you still got dividends, even though your distillery wasn't existing. You still got dividends from the trust. Most of the time, the trust would, even though you didn't have a distillery, they closed your distillery, they would make you the manager of that company, and they would pay you a salary for being manager of it. But that's still a company. You still got share, you still have a share of that company. And they would hire you to be the manager of that. And they, the trust never 
bought the land, they only leased the land that the facility was on. So as an owner, if you have to own the land too, you were getting rent off the off, the, off, the, off of the land. I'm going to skip this because I'm getting behind. This is how the Park Brothers did it. The other thing they did was uh, the Clark Brothers Distillery was worth $25,000. But he got 1,000 plus certificates that were valued at $100 per trust certificate. So he, the next day he got those, he could go out and he could sell them for $100. He had $100,000 in his pocket. Okay? But, uh, price never was a hundred, never got, you know, it was never that high, but that was also the opportunity to make money that way, if you could sell with a truck. So, and Charles C. Clark was hired and uh, the land was a, a lease. So in the, in the beginning, the trust did very well. So these are the first three years, 88, 89, 90. Uh, and you can see the production. So the blue is uh, the alcohol that was produced in Peoria. The red is the alcohol. The extra alcohol that was produced by other trust distilleries throughout uh, the Midwest. And the green is then all other distilleries. So when you add those together, you get total production. So you see production went up those three years. So consumption was going up uh, during those uh, uh, years. I, if we put that on a 100% chart, we put that production each year at 100%. We see that the trust, the blue plus the uh, red, was anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of all the alcohol that was produced in the United States. So, in essence, they were getting very close to being enough because they control the vast majority of the production in the uh, in the uh, country. Uh, 81, uh, 91, 92, 93 were the, the boom years for the trust. Uh, production was steady, not going up, and then production started falling off. Uh, we had a little bit of a recession, and because the trust was so successful, they were raising the prices of alcohol. Other uh, people started building facilities and not joining the trust. Okay, and so they got a lot more competition. So they were not able to stop people from coming into the timber market. Too easy to get into the still business. Not as easy to get into the oil business. Okay, it was easier for John Rockefeller to uh, have a monopoly than it was for these guys. And you can see that in these years, they were operating not very many of the of the, the still. And you can see that on a hundred percent basis, the trust was up to eighty percent. In those first three years, 91, 92, 93, they was up to 80, almost 90% of all the alcohol coming in the United States. I'm not going to talk about Takamini. I am doing a presentation at the uh, uh, UAR Hall on May 1st, just on the front. So I will go into a lot more detail if you want to come to that. Um, so we won't talk about Takamini. Because I got to get food. So this is a, a, a map of the, of the distilleries that were in uh, along the river, starting up there on the, up here, you see the post office, and then coming down. Uh, these were the primary distilleries. There were some other smaller distilleries around, but these were the primary distilleries that were in Peoria in the 1880s and the 1890s, early 1900s, okay? And all of these were in the in the uh, trust, uh, except uh, the Atlas was not in the trust. Uh, the Clark brothers joined the trust originally, but got disappointed with the trust. They closed the, the Clark distillery. So they went down on the south end there and built a new distillery. The Hanover was not a trust, and the Standard was not a, a trust uh, uh, distillery. The Atlas was owned by the Woolner brothers, and they were in the trust. The Woolner distilleries were in the trust, but they became discontented, or at least one brother became discontented with the trust. And so they opened up the Atlas in 1890 or 1891. Now, the Atlas only made industrial alcohol, 
And so I think it was probably more stumped uh, because it only made industrial. So 1895, the trust starts to fall into trouble. Um, the stockholders are very unhappy. They're, they have cut off dividends. They're not paying any dividends. Uh, they had set up a rebate system uh, where if you did all your business with the trust, you got a rebate and they had set that money aside and then they used that money, Green Hunt used that money to buy more distilleries to try to keep uh, their monopoly status up there high, 80 or 90%. So they, they quit doing the rebates. They got in trouble with their suppliers. Um, and so uh, the stockholders were demanding a meeting. They wanted to place meet up. And so in January of 1895, he went to Fort and in essence declared bankruptcy. Uh, but he wanted, he, Green Hunt wanted himself to be named as the receiver. So he could run the company while it was in bankruptcy. Stockholders didn't like that. Um, and uh, they, uh, the judge, uh, after talking, after interviewing Green Hunt, finds that he would strike right in the stock and doesn't have stock to cover what they say they have. And so uh, he made uh, names another uh, receiver for the uh, for the uh, uh, trust. By the way, they changed their name. You know, it started out as the Stillers and Cattle Feeders Trust. But in 1890, the uh, U.S. passed the Sherman Antitrust Act. So he didn't want to be called a trust. So they changed it to a uh, stock company and they changed the name to company. Okay, distill distillery and cattle feeders company. And instead of getting certificates, you now got stock. But that didn't work either. Um, so the, the uh, uh, guys from one of the Company in uh, uh, bankruptcy comes in and he first tries to get everybody together to keep the trust going. No one's interested in doing that. Uh, and so some of the stockholders in the old trust uh, formed a new company called the American Spirits Manufacturing Company. And they uh, uh, they were incorporated in New York, they were headquartered in Peoria. Uh, and they purchased 17 distilleries from the old trust. So the 17 best distilleries from the old trust. Uh, six of those distilleries were in pure. Ten of the distilleries, ten of the 17 were in LA. Um, and they paid about $10 million for those uh, 17 distilleries. So that was the end of the trust. Peoria will go on uh, to uh, continue manufacturing. Alcohol will be the leading producer of alcohol in the United States up until the time of, uh, of prohibition. Um, so the question was, did the failure of the trust, did that stop whiskey combination? Uh, and the answer is no. So American Spirits Manufacturing Company formed in 1895. They had 17 uh, distilleries. That was 60% of all the production in the United States. Um, in 1896, Spirits Distributing Company, where they were distributors, they were not distillers. Green Hunt was involved in this company. Um, they formed uh, in 1898. The Woolmers take their Atlas uh, Distillery and they form a company called the Standard uh, Distilling and Distributing Company. They had about 30% of the market in the United States. And then the, the ones from Kentucky that were in the trust formed their own company. Well, uh, Green Hunt was part of this also. Uh, and they formed the company, okay? Then in 1899, those four country companies come back together and form a new company. So the old trust is now all back together again. They just got rid of the smaller, uh, not profitable. Uh, uh, that uh, will go through a number of iterations. They will form an industrial alcohol company. Uh, during prohibition, they'll change their name from the story company to a food company. Uh, they go through bankruptcy, and then 1924, they become the National Distillers Products Company. Uh, some, of you, some of you in here, I think, are old enough, uh, but you, you may have heard of your family talking about National Distillery had, a, uh, after prohibition, had a, a, a distillery in Florida. Uh, 
So uh, they were the largest at the coal station. They were the largest distiller in the United States. So it all came back uh, together, basically. So a little bit on some of the uh, uh, whiskey barons, Joseph Greenhut, uh, born in Austria, uh, family came to Chicago when he was 10 years old. Uh, he uh, uh, was learning to be a tenant when the Civil War started, and he volunteered for the Civil War. He was uh, uh, wounded in, at Fort Donaldson in the Civil War. Uh, Came back, got well, formed his own company, uh, recruited his own company, went back in the war, was, was wounded again at Gettysburg. Uh, so was actually a, a war hero. After the war, uh, he gets to know a guy in Chicago who was in the uh, meatpacking business. And he actually had known cattle in Peoria that were being fed at the, at the story. And so he sent Green Hut down to Peoria to take care of his business here. Green Hut had run, after the war, had run a distillery uh, in the Chicago area. So he uh, was interested in the distillery. So in 1881, uh, he and uh, uh, Morris will form, and some others will form the Great Western Distillery, which in 1881 was the largest distillery in the world. Uh, this is his house. That's what it looked like when it was built in 1884. This is what it looks like now. It's on the corner of Sheridan and High Street and North Street, where North Street and Sheridan and High all come together there. Uh, it's a kind of a stucco place. That has apartments, condos now. Uh, it's no longer a, a single person residence. Um, he provided, again, a Civil War veteran. He provided the money for the GAR Hall. Uh, they were short money. They went to New York to see he left, left Peoria about a decade after the trust folded. Uh, and he gave him $10,000 to finish that GAR Hall, that is the Green Hut Memorial Hall now. Uh, the uh, Soldiers and Sailors uh, Monument down at the uh, courthouse, that's a Civil War monument. He was the primary uh, donor of money for that. Uh, and he also was big into. Uh, uh, art, sculpture. So this uh, piece of sculpture called Love Goes No Cask is in the um, lobby of the Peoria City Hall. Uh, and that was done by a Peoria named Chris Treble, who also did this monument over here. Very famous Peoria sculpture. So we still have things around Peoria uh, for Green Island. We have a lot of stuff that we did that we still have around Peoria. Uh, the Wolner family was another very prominent family in distilling. There were five brothers. They were Hungarian. Uh, they came over here. They were Jewish, probably we think, uh, that there was a pogrom in, in Hungary, even though they were a very prominent Jewish family distiller in Hungary. Uh, the father sent all five of the sons uh, to the United States. Uh, and they didn't start in Peoria, but they eventually get to Peoria, and they uh, start in the distilling business. Probably in 1900, they are the richest family in Florida uh, because of their uh, distilling and brewing. They own a brewery also. Uh, this is pictures of their two distilleries. The one eventually burnt down uh, at the Adams and uh, Fulton Street. Uh, they actually built their own office building that is no longer there. Uh, and you can still get Walmart memorabilia online there. You can find uh, Walmart uh, uh, stuff because they did do some production after Prohibition. So there's stuff in the market for it. They do have a big mausoleum out in uh, Springdale Cemetery uh, where uh, at least two of the brothers are uh, buried there. Uh, Charles Clark, we talked about earlier. His father, Charles S. Clark, started the uh, distillery with his brother, Sumner Clark. Sumner had a house on High Street. The house is still there. Uh, Sumner did not have any children. Charles S. Charles S. had two children, uh, Charles C. and Chauncey uh, uh, Clark. And so they took over the distillery. And that's when it became Clark Brothers uh, uh, Distillery. Uh, Robert Clark, we're not sure what the relationship is. Uh, but he did, he was involved in the, the story business. 
you know the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house on North Avenue? Across from the Presbyterian Church, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright house there. Robert Clark was the second owner of that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, house. Um, so they broke away from the trust uh, and uh, they were very proud of the fact that they were independent with the, you know, the, what their label said. They, uh, their distillery worked through the prohibition. They actually had an agreement with United uh, in St. Louis, and they uh, did some uh, stuff for United Bush. Uh, actually, during prohibition, some of the distilleries the in Peoria stayed open, so there was a big loophole in the uh, prohibition law that said, if your doctor said you needed alcohol, he, uh, you needed to keep oil, well, stay well, he could prescribe whiskey for you. And so this is where Walgreens got their start. They expanded all over, particularly Illinois and Midwest. This is where they got their start, was being a drugstore or medicinal alcohol. That was where you went to buy your booze uh, in uh, during uh, uh, prohibition. So they did some of the, they did some of that. Um, Chauncey Clark didn't stay in Peoria; he went to Arizona, and uh, he and uh, Joseph Green had owned some land out there. And so Chauncey Clark, uh, which is a whole other story, a fascinating story, but he is the one who founded. Oh, there's some of the memorabilia uh, that we. Uh, Clark Brothers rye whiskey was made after prohibition. So we have a lot of Clark Brothers stuff out on the open uh, market. And in fact, somebody still owns that brand. They don't make it anymore, but somebody still owns that brand. But anyway, Chauncey Clark, while living in uh, Arizona, found the town of Peoria, Arizona, which is one of the fastest one towns in the United States. And they named it Peoria because they wanted to move out there and, and uh, start living there. So prohibition comes. Uh, this was the, these were the, the, the facilities that are along the river there at the, at the start of prohibition. By the end of prohibition, those were all gone that you see there. Uh, the Great Western actually was dismantled during prohibition, but William Hall, who was our congressman who worked at the Great Western before he became a congressman, Talk Hiram Walker into coming in and buying that land. So the Hiram Walker distillery was built on the land where the old Great Western uh, distillery was uh, uh, located. Um, commercial solvents ran the Wolder uh, distillery for a while. The Monarch and the Atlas were combined by a new company called Century, and Century Distilling was in Peoria. Uh, and then National, you know, National Distillery took the old trust, the whiskey trust. They actually had the Clark distillery. This is after prohibition. Um, over time, these will kind of go away, but in 1939, because of the four big distilleries, and there were others, the four big distilleries we had in Peoria and the one in Beacon, Peoria still was producing, we think, 50% of the alcohol uh, in the United States. So we were still a major player. But over time, uh, these uh, go away. Uh, and if I, I don't know if any of your family members, National Distillery closed in the 50s, the Hiram Walker stayed on until 1982. And in 1982, uh, Hiram Walker closed, uh, and it was purchased by ADM, who continued to distill. Uh, and then they both uh, uh, industrial alcohol and consumption alcohol, and then turned it all over to ethanol production. Uh, and then just last year, that was sold to this uh, uh, South American company. They intend to continue to make ethanol and also uh, uh, alcohol that will be used for the commercial trade uh, also. Uh, as far as we know, this is still the largest distillery in the, uh, in the country. I don't know that they use all of the taxidermy. But it is still the ones. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the ones that peak and have the volume used to be more than one, but yes, the, the, 
And that the whole peaky thing is another interesting history in itself. Because there's old line peaky families that you know that that's where they that's where they got their stuff. Consumption now as well. Yes. Yeah. So you want a great book about uh, 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 and Peoria is a, a big part of this book. I recommend this book for the Urban Empire. Very, very interesting uh, uh, book. Um, so I'm going to let Maureen talk to you for a few minutes about, she brought some of the artifacts from the uh, 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 whiskey era that we have on display out of Wheels of Time Museum. Uh, so you want everybody to come over there or you want to say, oh, well, I'll stay on this whole. Oh, okay. And, All right. And I was going to say later, you're welcome to come over and look at it more, more thoroughly and more carefully. But as Brenda just said, that was something I wanted to make sure I said at the very beginning. I didn't forget. Please go out and look at the time when we had a chance. Look at the time open in May, and it opens in six months. But we were last to give us space to actually have an exhibit. On the Peoria Historical Society, and our exhibit is specifically on brewing and distilling. So I have to tell you that earlier this week on Tuesday, and, and that confiscated a few of our items. Because <laughs> when Bernie had asked me, and I think when Catherine had asked uh, if we could bring some artifacts, I kind of looked around the basement of Flanagan and looked in the office and realized all of our best stuff, of course, is out of wheels of time. But, um, I'm going to start right here because, of course, Bernie talked a lot about how important the tax was, as we know. And in order to get the accurate tax, the proof of the alcohol had to be accurate, right? So I'm gonna start with this. It's very simply a strainer. And what, and you would insert this into the, the bung of the barrel, right? And this would work to make sure all the flotsam was gone because you needed to have the pure alcohol to make sure that the proof was correct. Everything is about the proof, right? To make sure that you are taxing it correctly. Um, I wasn't able to bring a whiskey thief, but it's, it looks very similar to this. And that's where you pull the sample out of the barrel. That sample is then put into the copper cylinder with a thermometer and that would gauge, this would be a tool of one of the gaugers, right? That would gauge again the proof of the alcohol. Oh. Yeah. The gauger is a federally appointed employee. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the gaugers would usually be moved around. And that Peoria and St. Louis were part of a big scandal where uh, uh, the facilities were. Uh, paying money for a guy who's getting a whole bunch of extra bags. Yeah. Um, and then these four items are all connected to the marks that were placed onto the barrel, right? To indicate all the information about that particular um, barrel, right? The, the alcohol inside. This is one of my favorite pieces that we have. We have quite we have, I think, about three or four of, of the stencils. And as Bernie pointed out, he mentioned it's, um, we were in the fifth district, correct? Yeah. So we're not exactly sure. We do have a five here, but these particular numbers, of course, are not changing. But the other numbers, you just have to slide. I probably will be very gentle in doing it, but you just slid the number across and use that to mark specifically on the barrel with your ink and your. You also have to get, if you want me to hold it still, I certainly can. <laughs> yeah, you don't need me, just the stencil. And again, you can come over and take a peek at these. Um, very simply, a stamp. I liked what Catherine said earlier about if the library had a stamp like this, all patrons would know exactly when that <laughs> when that one has to do that. Um, this one is set to 1874. Gonna mess with that, right? And then also another stamp. This one is specifically from Hiram Walker. And when you come up, you'll notice that the numbers are across the side. So it's again kind of pounding into the barrel and stamping with a particular number. And then behind me here, 
Reputedly, this is a copper yeast jug that was used in Cole's first distillery. So Bernie mentioned, of course, the first distillery in Peoria, uh, Amour and Cole in, we believe, 1843-44, right? That this was used in his fermentation process in the very first distillery um, in Peoria. The yeast was the most important thing in the yeah. distillery. And you protected that. They still do. So yeah, it's, it's, it's cool looking too. That's the other thing. We really like this piece. It's pretty cool. So you think that came from the cold distillery? Yes. That's, that's what our information says. Our, our, data, data, our database right, right has, you know, whenever this was first donated, donated to, to us, us and, all and all the information was added, that's the information. Have I ever, have been, have I ever been, been there by it? By it? Yeah. But we're, we go with it. We like that story. Yeah. So those are the few items that I brought, but please, um, there's much more to be seen. We, we were for, super fortunate last year, 2021 kind of blended together, right guys? <laughs> um, but we received a wonderful donation from a couple who originally lived here. They're now in Fayette, um, they're in Indiana. Um, anyway, they brought us lots and lots of Cooper's tools because his father and grandfather had worked for a Cooperage. So we we're really fortunate to get those and they're part of the display of worth well. And I'll mention one more thing. Bernie has a, a looping video that's part of our display at this time. We greatly appreciate that he was able to, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you say, Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got one last thing. Please help yourself to, I brought a few things. There's a flyer here on the Peer Historical Society that talks about you know, our historic house museum. And we also produce uh, a timeline newsletter quarterly and I just and <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't offer um, the opportunity to join the Peer Historical Society if you're interested. So the information there on membership as well. Okay, get your uh your seats out. We're gonna go through the act. Oh, one out here. So what we must be trying to do is monopolize uh alcohol. Can I get those lights off, Kathy? Sorry, sorry lights on and off. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, okay. I changed the setting so, and everything. Okay. These 13 distilleries that, that look like trees here, those 13 distilleries, most of which are in Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, those 13 distilleries today still control. 90% of our Odis Brewery are the stories that have become really popular. You know, you got your own little brand, bourbon type. Uh, but the industry is still dominated by the giants. Now, so those 13 stories. Uh, now, they are the ownership is that actually spread out over. Uh, I know there were more companies involved and international companies. You know, Suntory, all of these are still, these are real. Suntory's Japanese, Kieran Japanese, Kabari's European, uh, the Island's European. So there's a lot more diversity in the ownership. But those 13 facilities still dominate. We almost still have, don't have the trust, but they still have. Uh, a huge distillery in most of the in most of the on the distillery. Not going, Catherine. Oh, so we need a long I might have.